Okay, everyone, so we are session 11, chapters 11 and 12 of the Acts of the Apostles. And we've been learning in this session from Jeff Cavins about the church in Antioch and the beginnings of a persecution and the death of James and Peter escaping from prison. And it's fascinating to hear about this church in Antioch as opposed to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was more like conservative, while as um, Ant um, Antioch was much more explosively liberal, I suppose you could say in the sense that there was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles and the Holy Spirit was so active there, it became a platform for missionary disciples, really, the first missionary disciples to, to pray and to build their teams and to leave on missionary journeys of evangelization. So it's fascinating to hear about Antioch. But I want to concentrate on a few little points, uh, develop a few things that Jeff Cavins did. First of all, I'd like to speak about the Herods, because we think... Herod maybe is just one person, but actually there's four Herods in the New Testament. There's Herod the Great, who was from 37 BC to 4 BC. He was the Herod present at the Nativity of Jesus when he was born. He was a master builder. He built the temple. He built uh, the Herodian, which is a huge tomb, if you like, just south of Bethlehem. He built the port in Caesarea Maritima where Cornelius was converted and where we will be speaking about today. This was a genius. He was a genius constructor. He was, he was brutal. He was a tyrant. But he was centuries ahead of his time when it came to technology. He first developed in the port of uh, Caesarea Maritima an artificial port built with underwater cement, which was because of its volcanic mix coming from all the way from Naples. He was able to make underwater cement, uh, which was stronger even than the cement that we know today and has lived right through the centuries. So and of course, he, he, he built the temple as well, the second temple. And he also built Masada, which was a famous temple right by the Dead Sea. Then from 4 BC onwards, it's Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas is the one who put John the Baptist to death. And then we have in the Acts of the Apostles, Two Herods, Herod Agrippa I from 37 AD to 44 AD, and then um, Herod Agrippa II, before whom Paul appears in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, so you see there's four, there's four Herods, and it's good sometimes to distinguish them. And it's fascinating to learn about them as well. I've been, I'm reading a little book right now about Herod the Great, and he, he was a genius, but he had his flaws and he was a control freak. And we can, we can see this with the murder of the innocents at Christmas, uh, at the birth of Jesus. Um, he couldn't support any challenge to his power. But, you know, uh, Herod, four Herods, and so sometimes it's good to situate that when we're reading, especially in the Acts of the Apostles, with which Herod we are dealing with. I'd like to zoom in now a little bit on that passage that Jeff Caven just developed about Peter in prison. Because it's a fascinating passage to help you understand the passage of Peter from Jerusalem to Rome, where we have the Pope today, obviously. Peter died in Rome. He was martyred in Rome. But how did he get there? And we'll see that with both scripture and tradition, we can kind of knit together the passage. So we see at the beginning of chapter 12, things get dark because up to now, the lay people were being persecuted and killed. But now Herod and uh, they're targeting the leaders of the church. And sadly, James, the brother of John, is beheaded by Herod Agrippa I. And so Peter is captured, and Peter is set to have his head cut the next day. And as you saw, he's put into prison, and it's Passover, and he's asleep, and he wakes up, and he escapes. You, don't reckon... you see right through this passage, echoes of the resurrection, parallels with the resurrection, to show that our lives are also mirroring the life of Jesus. And we see that uh, Luke is going to show us that the church is praying devoutly for his release. So Luke is going to show us the power of prayer. God is going to answer prayer in a powerful way. And Peter is put with 16 soldiers. So that he's a high valued uh, prisoner and they don't want to lose him. High value target. And they have two guys chained to him at nighttime. And Peter's sound asleep. He's snoring. I mean, if I was, if I knew I was going to die next morning, I was going to be beheaded. I'm not sure I would sleep so soundly. <laughs> anyway, Peter must have been uh, 
confident in God's grace and mercy. And of course, to understand, if in Roman law, if you're a soldier and a prisoner escapes during your watch, you are to be executed. And this is important because the Christians would say that God delivered Peter from prison, but nobody could say that they bribed God to release him because what God would take money in order to get executed? The price, there isn't a price high enough. And this painting uh, of Raphael, of Peter in prison, is beautiful. You have the light of the moon. There's a little bit of moonlight coming into the cell. And there was a bit of dawn breaking. But the main light of the prison is the light of the angel. And this great line of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. God led you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So Raphael, the artist, shows the soldier slept asleep and bent over asleep. And the light is reflected and it's illuminating. So you have Peter in the center who's chained and the angel is waking him up. And it's kind of humorous, really, because uh, he, he, he thinks he's in a dream. and takes a while for the angel. Hey, Peter, Peter, come on, get up. So then you have the passage of Peter escaping with the angel to be free. And there are several plays on light. You have the light of the torch, the light of the moon, the light of the dawn, the light of God, which dominates all these lights in the end. And so it's a fabulous painting, and it's in the Vatican Museum if ever you get to see it. But all of a sudden, Peter's out. He goes through the open doors. He, he, he goes by the, the guards who are in tetatonic state. He finds himself outside, and all of a sudden he realizes, hey, this is not a dream. This is true. So he goes to John Mark's house, because he knew his mother and his family, the writer of the gospel, the one he will call my son. My son Mark is with me in Babylon later on. And uh, a lady called, a servant called Rhoda answers the door. And she's so shocked that there's Peter at the door. She slams the door in his face and runs in to tell everybody and forgets to let him in because people are, uh, there's great turmoil. Everybody's searching for him in, um, in Jerusalem. But so Peter is shipped to Caesarea Maritima. Why is this? First of all, Herod is looking for Peter. And Peter goes to Caesarea because Herod does not have dominion in Caesarea. It's a Roman jurisdiction. So Herod could not arrest him there. But there's another reason for this. He goes there because he now has a powerful friend, Cornelius, who's just been baptized. Now you see providence here. So Peter goes to Caesarea, then disappears. And Luke says he goes to another place. But tradition kicks in here and shows us that Peter actually went to Rome. Uh, okay, so I think Luke didn't mention that there was Rome because it was probably too dangerous to mention it at that time. It would have been too subversive to the Roman Empire. So tradition picks up here, says that Peter went to Rome in the year 42. How does he get there? Cornelius fixes him up to stay with his friend called Pudens, Senator Pudens in Rome. That's where they're connected. So Cornelius is from an, an Italian cohort, so he's from Rome. He was a God-fearer, meaning he was open to God's grace in his life, and he knew other God-fearers in Rome, and he connects Peter with these. And he brings him to a house in Rome, the house of Senator Pudence. And uh, I think Luke gives us a key here to unlocking this mystery. So um, Peter ends up in Rome, he's with Pudence, and we know this through tradition because uh, there's a church in Rome called Santa Pudencia, Pudenciana, and it's called after the daughter of Pudence, who and two, his two daughters actually, who were known for heroically burying the dead martyrs, early Christian martyrs, who were murdered by the by Nero uh, in his persecution of Christians, and also for saving many as well. And they would hide them and also bury them under their home, and they become famous in the tradition. But what's fascinating about this church in Rome, it's, it has one of the oldest mosaics in the whole of Rome. It dates back to 390 AD and it shows 12 apostles. And the 12 apostles are all wearing Roman senatorial togas, which is kind of uh, striking. And the backdrop of the mosaic is the buildings from the Holy Land. So you can see the connection there with, with Jerusalem. So it's one of the most important churches in Rome, actually. It's a hidden one. But Peter lived there for so many years. He said Mass there. And you can see the altar where he said Mass. 
Um, it's not in great condition, like many churches in Rome. Things are a bit uh, not always taken care of. But in a scavi tour underneath, you can see, you can visit, and you see there's a brick there marked with Senator Pudens' stamp. So that's the connection uh, with um, with Senator Pudens. And um, also in Second Timothy chapter four, we see that Paul mentions Pudens as well in Rome. Do your best to come before winter. Uh, Ubilus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. So. Pudens is a senator, Linus becomes the second pope, they're both senators, and Claudia is probably the wife of Pontius Pilate, so you see the connection there, how Roman aristocracy is being converted and opening their houses. And the tradition says then that there were Roman baths built underneath that church in Rome, under the house of Pudens, and they were transformed into baptismal uh, uh, fonts. And uh, as well, just as Peter baptized Cornelius, we see now that Peter baptizes Pudens. So you see that connection through scripture and tradition. Peter leaves Jerusalem, goes to his powerful friend Cornelius, makes that connection, who connects him with people in Rome. And Peter goes to hide there and to minister in Rome and eventually die. And the rock Peter is built thanks to his connections with Cornelius and Pudence.